<laughs> so um, George was a was a professor at UCLA in biology. He studied for his doctorate. He studied herpetology and um, evolution, and um, he has done conservation work um, in Costa Rica. And he was on the board of a uh, conservation organization also for Mesoamerica. So that's just a slight overview of George. He's uh, going to talk to us about his adventures as a young researcher in Tobago. No, Trinidad. Trinidad. Well, Trinidad. Tobago also. <laughs> What's that? Tobago also? Tobago also. But much well, more and throughout the world, right? <laughs> He's traveled all over. Okay, so let's get started. And yes. so I, so this is going to be an odd talk. I hope it's not too odd in that it's semi autobiographical and semi general about uh, so lizards and speciation and how we go about studying these things um, and um, semi struggling to get through uh, <laughs> to get through it. So I started out by saying, oh, why lizards and why not? They're cute, they're interesting. I learned a lot. They paid me to study them and I got to see much of the world. So, so that, that's my introduction. Um, what, what used to be my second screen is uh, now gonna be the last one, the summary. So that's why I said Hillary were slightly out of order. So this is a study of um, anolis lizards. And I've already met somebody who knows the person who made the films. We're going to see a couple of short five minute films who was at Harvard. <clears throat> I ultimately got my degree at Harvard. It was very, uh, my life is very circuitous. A lot of things happen by accident and we'll talk about some of that. Um, so lizards are very generalized vertebrates found throughout the world, except the coldest places like Antarctica or, or Alaska. Um, they're particularly abundant in the tropics and the deserts. Uh, they do particularly well on islands. There are fantastic numbers of species on islands. So they're um, very interesting to the evolutionary biologists. There are about 4,000 species of lizards in this world, and 10% of them are in one genus called Anolis, which are captured by fancy. And I spent many years of, of looking at them, filming them, looking at, trying to look at their genes and things like that. And that's what we'll be talking about. Um, <clears throat> they range in size, adult size from approximately 10 cent piece US. That's an adult gecko from the West Indies from a small island off of Hispaniola um, to the famous Komodo dragon which is uh, an island species in Indonesia. They're found on three or four of the islands around Komodo. Um, these guys get up to 150 kilos, 12, 13 feet. They're vicious predators and they work together. Turns out it, it was formerly said that they uh, would infect their, their victims, but they, it, it turns out they are slightly venomous. That's, that's been proven. And what they do is they work together, they slash a prey item, and then uh, wait for it to die. They just follow it around for a couple of days and then tear it apart. So quite different from the, uh, the dime-sized lizard. But as I said, I've been lucky enough to see these guys in the field and um, see the 10 cents. Well, uh, my, I saw a 25 cent size lizard. I never saw the world's smallest. Um, <clears throat> we took this um, near Komodo on one of the other islands where they occur. And um, I, I call this all the, uh, what is it, the, the lamb lying down with the lions. This poor deer doesn't know what's going to hit him because he's going to have a group around here and this is going to be dinner. Um, there are other islands that have fantastic radiations of lizards. This was a, this is a chameleon. Sometimes I say only a mother could love it uh, from Madagascar. There are 30 or 40 species of chameleons on Madagascar, but they're not restricted to Madagascar. They're found not only in uh, uh, throughout Africa, but uh, they even get into Europe. There, there's one chameleon that's in, in Spain. And these guys are 
another large group, I'd say 50 species on Madagascar, but uh, at least another 50 or so in the rest of their distribution. And they have fantastic eyes that move independently, but we're not talking about them. Just giving you an idea of the diversity of lizarddom that uh, we guys get to play with. This is a very unscintillating lizard, but also from Madagascar. And I, I bring it up only for the reason I, we don't have to even worry about a scientific name. It looks like if you're into California desert lizards, we have things that look like this. And in fact, it's a case of convergent evolution. And in fact, it's interesting because Madagascar has quite a number of organisms that are more closely related to the new world than the old world. So in the old world, you have agamid lizards. This is an iguanid lizard found, uh, its relatives are in the new world, which is kind of interesting. Also the snakes on Madagascar, they have boas and not pythons, the boas of new world. So this is uh, for those who understand continental drift and how the planet has moved around, that must be the answer. So Madagascar is highly recommended for seeing all kinds of wonderful creatures. Um, that's the same species eating a frog. I just thought it was a nice picture. By the way, I am unable to magnify some of my pictures. Next time, my technology will be better and more amusing, and we'll, we'll get through it. Um, I've been, as I said, lucky enough to get around and see all kinds of, of totemic, charismatic lizards. Uh, there's a marine iguana, but they don't spend their whole life in the ocean. They do feed in the ocean. They're the only lizard that uh, feeds and spends time in salt water. Uh, they eat algae, but they come out on land and sun themselves. So this is, they, they also like the little guest houses, I guess, in, in Galapagos. So this one came right up to our uh, place where we were staying. And this is again in the iguanid family, which is basically new world, except for these crazy things in Madagascar and an iguana on Fiji that probably got there from the opposite of Thor Heyer. Let's see, how did Thor Heyerdahl go from, <laughs> he went from South America to the South Pacific, I guess. Maybe they took the same route. Um, this uh, organism is very special to me because it looks like a lizard. It probably tastes like a lizard. I haven't tasted it, but um, it is not a lizard. It's in an order of its own. It's called the Tuatara and lives in, in um, New Zealand. We got to see it in New Zealand early this year. Um, these are very extraordinary animals in that they like cold weather. Their eggs take about 13 months to hatch. Um, everything is in slow motion with these guys. And they are found only in New Zealand. They're the only member of this order that's been extinct for I think a couple hundred million years. Um, so I, I got to add that to my life list of, of reptilian families. Um, now, as I said, we were in New Zealand early this year. Um, COVID hit in March. Uh, our older son said, stay there, stay there, you won't get sick. And he was right, but we're glad we came home. He, he would have been right. Um, but we're going to be focusing on this lizard genus Enolus which um, has become um, a may, um, a, a, an, in, an institution or, or a, I don't know, a cosmic or, organism like Drosophila, the fruit flies for study of genetics, for study of speciation. Um, they live in very nice places in general. Um, they're characterized by two special features that they all seem to have, which is this extensible throat fan called the dewlap and adhesive toe pads. They're not suction cups, they're not really adhesive, they're tiny little hairs, really tiny, and uh, they can run up and down panes of glass. Um, and I think they're quite beautiful. And uh, as I say, it became my bread and butter. And I'll tell you how, it's quite, it's quite a funny story because I wasn't necessarily an anolis guy in my youth, but I was a reptile guy. <clears throat> the anoles uh, come in various, that most of them are pretty, pretty similar looking, but there are some weird dudes. And this one is well-named Anolis proboscis. 
the males have these funny things sticking out their nose and they wiggle them around and the ladies think it's cute and they use it in courtship. Um, this is one of the strangest looking is an Ecuadorian species. And this one, in my opinion, is one of the most gorgeous anoles. Um, it's a Cuban anole and it's a cave anole. This is on the outside of caves. It's very much like a gecko, like you know about the Geico gecko. Geckos have the same kind of toe pad feet. They're mainly, mainly nocturnal. This guy is a Cuban endemic. And I was lucky enough to, in 1967, uh, well into Castro's years and well into um, Cuba being forbidden territory, I was able to get State Department permission and Cuban permission to roam around Cuba for a month <laughs> to chase a nose. Um, and I had help from Cuban scientists and Jeeps and they were happy to have an American. The whole thing is insane. I, I wrote a letter to the editor in Science that was published, I guess, in early 68 saying, why do we have these embargoes and blah, blah, blah. And it's still going on. It's, it's quite astonishing. Um, I'm, not in, I'm not political or anything, but Cuba is no worse than a lot of other South American countries in terms of freedom. And, and well, I won't go into politics. They have great lizard fauna. The area of anolis distribution in general and of my work in general has been the Caribbean region. They are found into Florida. That's the tip of Florida right there. Um, there are four greater Antillean islands, Cuba, Hispaniola, which is two countries, Jamaica, which they're, they're not so great, but they're, they're much bigger than the lesser Antilles, which we we'll talk about, and Puerto Rico. Um, and there's been enormous amount of interest in, in the evolution on these uh, islands and in this chain called the Lesser Antilles, uh, which goes south to, to through Grenada. The interesting thing about Trinidad and Tobago, biologically, and I don't know if any of you who are birders, I don't know if Audrey has been out to Asa Wright, there's a birding place there. Trinidad and Tobago basically have a South American fauna. They are called continental islands. Um, Alfred Russell Wallace really distinguished between the oceanic and continental islands. These chains have come up from the sea, volcanoes. So, the connect so they tend to have endemic species which got there by rafting, by some, some kind of accidental means. And each island bank here has its own endemic species, not only of lizards, but of frogs and even to some extent birds, even though birds can fly. Trinidad has almost no endemic species. And so it's a little slice of South America, which kind of makes it um, interesting because it's so close to the, um, to the Lesser Antilles. <clears throat> and um, just want to show you, there's some lovely books about my, these creatures. And this was written by a, a Cuban woman who's simply, she's died recently. But most of the lizards of Cuba, mostly the iguana lizards, and most of the lizards are in fact anoles. They come with these pretty colored dewlaps. The males are generally larger than the females, have showier dewlaps. It's a little like the bird world, uh, which they poke out both to be aggressive towards other males. They're highly territorial, and they're um, and then and and in courtship. Um, and then we also have convergent evolution. This is a from Sri Lanka. This is, a, I don't know the common name, so we won't bother with its name, but it has a dewlap. It looks very much anno like um, and is in a whole other family. So you, but if you have those toe pads and you have the throat fan, you're pretty much in a nose. My work was in the, mainly in the Lesser Antilles in Trinidad and Tobago. And this is just one of my, this is, um, well, this lizard love. And you can see the size sexual dimorphism. The man is hugely, hugely bigger than the, man, uh, than the female. And there's a breeding pair in, in, on the island of Martinique. And what's really amazing on some of these small lesser Antillean islands is that there is subspeciation on relatively small islands. There are geographic differences 
between very short distances between uh, habitat, habitats can be quite different. It can be quite verdant, uh, rainy, a little up the mountain, dry, almost desert-like. And so uh, in a number of these, although it's presumably the same species and potentially can share, share genes, there are very striking differences. This is just a close-up of what the toes look like, the, the famous toes with these lamellae, and these lamellae have microscopic hairs. This is a 300 time magnification. These are different the lamellae, and then a 10,000 time magnification of these little things that can grip any imperfection in, in the glass or substrate and uh, let these guys climb. So a little about me, and then we'll learn a little about Anolis. I come from, um, I, I find it, I, I, you know, I find my, my life story kind of weird because I grew up in a very urban environment. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. My parents had no interest in nature or the outdoors, but unfortunately for them, my grandfather who lived in the same apartment house, I don't think he had any interest, but he used to take me to the Prospect Park Zoo, which was across the street from my apartment house. So from one window, I'd see Ebbets Field and the Dodgers, and they were very important to me. And the other, I, I was, um, sort of imprinted on zoos and animals at a, at a fairly um, early age. So this is my late grandfather, very late, <laughs> and um, this nascent uh, zoo goer. Um, now, just I, just a digression. I, I I show you a picture of his daughter, my mother. He had several daughters, because this year. Something very strange happened when we went to, I told you, we went to New Zealand. And there, I saw my mother on the $20 New Zealand bill. I'm, I'm sure that I am now, I'm now convinced, take a look, that I am part of British royalty. And in fact, I'm older than Prince Charles, so who knows where I stand in this. Anyway, that's a digression. Um, I developed an interest in nature after we moved from Brooklyn to the suburbs, but there was still, they weren't that developed. There was still nature. There were ponds. There were salamanders I could catch. And I got very into uh, amphibians and reptiles in general. And in fact, became a counselor in a Boy Scout camp. Now, here's another personal thing, totally irrelevant to our studies. But um, A, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, the wife of that grandfather you saw, had a phobia for amphibians and reptiles. She, she couldn't even stand looking at turtles and frogs. I never met anybody who didn't like turtles or frogs, or at least, but she had a phobia of these things. We used to keep them in the house. So that's one thing. My mother, their, their family history is interesting in that the grandfather came to America in 1913 with his oldest daughter plan was to bring the family over. Well, a few things started like World War I and the Russian Revolution, and they didn't get out until 1920 or 21. Um, and my mother hated military uniforms, so she wouldn't let me join the Boy Scouts um, because of the uniforms. It's kind of interesting. But my friends were all going to this camp, and I talked my way into becoming a nature counselor. I joined a a tribe or a troop or whatever they call them, and spent a number of happy summers teaching kids nature. So that's how my sort of career began. Then I got into snakes. I started catching them and then keeping them in captivity. And uh, that's probably the last time I wore a suit. I guess I was dressing up this in high school. Um, but this is a lecture to, a, to a, um, a Cub Scout group. This is late high school. When I went um, in junior high, I, we had to do what was called an occupation unit. We had to talk about what we wanted to be. And I had read a, um, stuff from a, an author named Raymond Dittmars, who was the curator of reptiles at the Bronx Zoo. And I said, I want to be the curator. I didn't say I want to be a bioscientist or a biologist or herpetologist. I wanted to be the curator of reptiles at the Bronx Zoo. So I, um, I interviewed the then living curator of reptiles in the Bronx Zoo. 
And I thought, his kids are so lucky. Their father's a herpetologist. Whoa. Um, I know a lot of kids whose fathers now are herpetologists, and I didn't give a damn, but <laughs> it's a whole other thing. Um, in, in any case, when I did that interview, I learned that there was a program for people like me <laughs> who were interested. And a number of the, there were meetings at the Bronx Zoo on a monthly basis that the curator actually held for young kids. And a number of us became uh, professional biologists, which is, I think, quite cool and interesting. When I got to college, I, I went to Cornell. I'm giving you too much information here, but um, I'll slow down in a minute. Um, I was Cornell at different colleges, and I was in the College of Arts and Sciences, which didn't have the organisms. It, it was mainly a pre-med kind of zoology major. Um, but somebody, a uh, professor I met there told me, you've got to go up to the ag school and that's where they have natural history and that's where they have genetics and this and that. And then he said, and then you have to go to grad school at Harvard and study with E.O. Wilson because he's brilliant. And he was young then, he was, this is about 65, 70 years ago. Um, so I, I, uh, I did my Cornell thing and the summer before my last year, I took a, a summer school, this is a real digression, a summer school intensive course in Russian language. It was a little post Sputnik and Russian was Derrigor or something, I thought it was. It included a trip to the Soviet Union. Well, I met a couple of people from other universities, one from California, well, two of them from Berkeley. And they told me that Berkeley is the most wonderful place in the world and you have gotta come to Berkeley. So this, this was very interesting because um, I did. <laughs> I didn't go to Harvard. <laughs> I went to Berkeley. I'd never been west of uh, Michigan. Michigan was my, I'd never been west of Michigan. I mean, west, that was my trip west when I went that summer. And um, when I applied to grad school, I applied to Harvard and Berkeley. And I came out to Berkeley and I thought I would study with Robert Stebbins, who's written the field guides to the purpose of this area. But I fell under the spell of um, um, Peter Marler, who was an animal behaviorist. I took his course my first year and I loved that stuff. And in the interim, I had been put in contact with a professor at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad, who was a herpetologist. And he told me about this amazing Enola situation where there was two species, and nobody could find any ecological differences between them and they couldn't understand, but they would find only pure uncle there'd be one species in one place, another species in another place, but nobody could figure out why the distribution seemed puzzling. And, and um, I said, okay, I'll study their behavior. And Peter Marler sponsored me for a, they call it a traveling fellowship. So my second year as a Berkeley student, I spent in Trinidad and then started traveling to various islands. So that's sort of the nature of my explorations. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going on too long. Um, shut me up if you want or wave your hand. I'll tell you about another, another boot. This is a great boondoggle. Now, this is much later in life. This is a little out of order. Um, when I was at Harvard, which I did do after Berkeley, but, um, there was an Israeli biologist who said, let's study lizards on the Greek islands. So that sounded good. And then I learned um, that there was something called public law 480, which was money that the um, US government had to burn. It was, um, let's say there was a trade deal with Yugoslavia where we ended up working. And so we owned lots of millions of dollars worth of Yugoslav dinars and we had to spend them in Yugoslavia. So I, so I learned about that and I said, well, we can't, I mean, there's free money for, um, for Yugoslavia, let's go to the Adriatic, why not? So we applied for a grant and I had to fly to Smithsonian and they gave me the grant, it was for $4,000. And the guy said, look, we're trying to burn this, money. we're trying to get rid of this, you know, this is too small. So next year do, do better. So the first year there were four of us who went including Amy, who went along, um, that's my wife, for those who don't know. And um, 
we got started, we did some interesting work on the islands, but the next year it was really, I mean, they literally went into the Yugos, to the embassy and they fill up my briefcase with dinars and say, go. So that was, that was really quite, quite, quite something. So the second year we had two yachts going up and down the islands and two rented cars or one rented car and 10 people, including my son, Ari, who was three months old. I mean, <laughs> this was, and we had a wonderful time. We've written a lot of papers and some people even still cite them today. I can't believe it, but okay. That's my digression. That's my uh, better half uh, in a glam shot among the poppies in, in Yugoslavia. Uh, this is uh, 50 years ago. <laughs> now, another uh, wonderful uh, trip. So you're getting this that involved islands, but I didn't really do island work. I worked at Marine. I, wanted, I was to study sea snakes in the Philippines. I got a grant to do that. And this is potential child abuse. I could probably be arrested. This is their son holding uh, poison snakes. These are the mother and baby. However, the secret is they don't bite. They, they, this is a species that eats only fish eggs and has tiny, tiny little teeth, but um, it sounds good. Now we're going to get into Enolis and the studies. Um, I have a couple of films I want to show, but it might take 20 minutes. Will that run too long? Are people with us? Okay. All right. So now I hit preview YouTube, right? Number one. These films were made by Jonathan Lossos of Harvard, um, whom Gregory knew and knows and knows about. So there's somebody who actually knows about the lizard story. Um, this will give a general view of why these are, the diversity of these animals and why they are important in evolutionary studies. So we're gonna look at a couple of these and see if, if we don't get too bored. Likely I hear it. I love telling people how some of our greatest insights into life on this planet have come from studying these unassuming little lizards that we call anoles. An anole is typically a small lizard. They weigh a few grams, maybe uh, four inches long. If you ever get a chance to meet one up close and personal, they're surprisingly charismatic and cute. A lot of people are somewhat squeamish around reptiles, um, but these lizards are really, really beautiful. There's a lot of color diversity, there's size diversity, there's shape diversity. There are 400 species of them. Some anoles live in trees high up in the treetops, and some anoles live on the trunks, and some anoles live on the grass, and some anoles live out on the twigs. It really is an explosion of diversity in this group of animals. So it's one of the things that makes them so intriguing. They have this dewlap, which is a throat fan that extends out underneath their chin, and it's very brightly colored and different species have different colored dewlaps and they'll extend them and they'll do push-ups when they see other males or when they see females. So a male that display is basically telling the females, I'm here and I'm available. And the more he does that, hopefully the more females will respond and say, yeah, maybe we would like to mate. When two males confront each other, they start displaying at each other, doing push-ups and sticking out their dewlap. If that doesn't settle the dispute, the conflict then escalates into a violent battle. Another distinguishing feature of anoles is that they have enlarged toe pads that help them cling to smooth surfaces. The toe pads. Zoom in. You can see the claw, the end of the toe. And these enlarged scales on the toe pad here are lamellae. Each one of those lamellae have millions and millions of little tiny hairs called setae. And it's those setae that adhere to surfaces to generate clinging force. Got toe pads and a dewlap, he's got an anole. If it's got just toe pads, it's probably a gecko. And if it has just a dewlap, it could be a number of other things, but it's not an anole. So if it's got those two things, that's how you know it. 
The gnolls eat anything they can get in their mouths. Mostly insects, but they'll also eat fruit, nectar, vertebrates, even other anoles. Some are widely foraging, going around looking for prey. Others are sitting away predators. So there's a lot of diversity in every aspect of their biology that we can study. Often when I'm talking to friends and family about my research, their first question is, well, why, why are you studying these lizards? Why do you care? The reason I study lizards is not because I love lizards, although I do, but it's because lizards are a great model organism to understand evolutionary principles, how evolution works. A lot of what we know about both ecology and evolutionary biology has come from studying anoles. Recently, there's been a real surge in studies uh, that use anoles. They extend into all other fields of biology, you know, biology of invasion, uh, developmental biology, endocrinology, conservation biology. I think anoles are an attractive system to study because they are abundant in many areas. They're also really easy to observe in the field. They are distributed on over 7,000 islands in the Caribbean. And each of those islands is like an individual petri dish where experiments have occurred. It makes for a really powerful natural laboratory for understanding how the process of evolution plays out. I tell my students that any study is more interesting when it's done on an anole. So I welcome everyone to studying anoles. There are plenty of anoles to go around. Whether you're uh, a biologist you know, who's been studying animals for decades or whether you're you know, a child you know, just running around your backyard, anoles, they just offer a point of, of connection. They're different enough to be intriguing you know, but not so different that you can't relate to them. They're like right in that, that Goldilocks zone. <laughs> In these videos, you'll see researchers using anoles to tackle many of the big questions in biology, from ecology and evolution to physiology and behavior. A lot of my work has focused on one particular question. When you start with the same environmental conditions, will evolution produce the same result time and time again? Let's do this one and then that's OK. OK. And then we'll Okay, so that, oops, so that, you want to go on to the next one? I do. Okay, here we go. There are 400 species of animals. A classic question for an What's it doing? I'm trying. For all biologists, and for evolutionary biologists in general, is how do new species arise? How did we go from having one species to 400? <laughs> Speciation is the process by which one species splits into two species. Basically, diversification has two parts. Speciation, which is the production of new species, and adaptation, how species adapt to where they live. Speciation plus adaptation equals biological diversity. In anoles, we know a lot more about adaptation than we do about how speciation occurs. And that's why our current research is focusing on speciation. There are many ways to define what a species is. And honestly, researchers disagree on the precise definition. But the one that I favor and the one that's been around the longest is reproductive isolation. That means that two species, when they come together, unable to produce any offspring at all, or if they do produce offspring, they're infertile. A wild example would be a pairing between a walrus and a bird. They're, of course, not going to produce any offspring. A more nuanced example, though, is uh, a commonly known one. Horse and donkey, when brought together, can produce mules. Mules are an offspring, but they're not fertile. They're never able to reproduce. Therefore, donkeys and horses are different species. And so in practice, speciation is the process by which barriers arise between populations that prevent them from interbreeding. 
there can be lots of different anole species living together in the same forest. And so the lizards have a problem. How do they tell members of their own species from members of other species? They don't want to waste time courting a female of the wrong species or doing battle with a male. Anoles identify members of their own species in two ways. One is the dewlap. Whenever you see species of anoles living together, they always differ in their dewlap, either the size of the dewlap, the color, or the pattern. Learn your dewlap colors. You can just basically tell which species it is without seeing anything else. If you tell me I caught this lizard in Puerto Rico and have a red dewlap, I will say it's a nice color. You have to see it. No, don't worry. I'm sure. Or if you tell me I caught this an all in Puerto Rico and it got this dewlap that looks sort of drab and brown, I say, yeah, that's the beautiful anole. It's gone lucky. It's a species recognition signal. That's the idea. This is my color. I'm this species. Similarly, the pattern by which they bob their heads up and down when they display to each other. Some are jiggle, 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 big. Some are big, slow, big, slow. Each species has its own pattern. And so by looking at the dewlap and the head bobbing pattern, an individual can know whether another lizard is a member of its own species or not. A great example comes from two species of anoles in the Dominican Republic, Anolus cybodes and Anolus marcanoi. And if you looked at them from a distance, they look identical. However, when they stick out their dewlap, Cybodes has a white dewlap with a pale yellow wash, and Marcanoi has a very red dewlap. So the dewlaps are very different. If you put two Cybodes together, they fought like cats and dogs. You put Marcanoi together, and they fought. But you put a Marcanoi and a Cybodes together, and they kind of go stick out their dewlap, and that was about it. It's like they said, oh, wrong species, not worried about you. Then we did this experiment where we changed the color of the dewlap. And we did that with the Cybodes. We pulled out its dewlap and we took red coral lipstick and just smeared the lipstick on the dewlap to make it red like Marcanoi. And then you put it in with the Marcanoi and then they fought. You did the same thing to the Marcanoi. You, you made its dewlap whiter with clown makeup. And so changing the color of the dewlap did actually fool them into thinking that lizards that weren't their own species really were. Now, what this suggests is that the evolution of the dewlap may play an important role in the speciation process. The classic view of speciation has been that it occurs in populations that are isolated, physically isolated from one another geographically. Over time, genetic differences accumulate in those isolated populations to the point where if they were to come back into secondary contact, they're no longer able to interbreed. More recently, we've come to understand that adaptation and natural selection play an important role in the evolution of new species. One such theory is ecological speciation. And that says that adaptation to distinct habitats while populations are in isolation generate the changes that when brought back into contact result in populations being infertile when they pair with one another. So the current debate is which of these processes is more important, isolation or divergent natural selection? Right now, we're in the midst of a very large experiment to understand the relative importance of the classic model of speciation and the adaptive ecological speciation hypothesis. The classic model emphasizes random genetic changes that occur between populations. To actually see those changes, we need to get genome sequences and compare them between populations. So the genome is an important tool in studying speciation. An organism's genome is the sum total of all of the genes in that organism, and they're responsible for making the organism what it is. The old genome let's, is the let's first go up. Of genome to be sequenced. It's fairly large, it's 2.2 billion bases. And in those, there are about um, 18,000 genes. That's actually quite- I think it's enough. <laughs> number of uh, genes that humans have. Let's move on, it's getting late. <laughs> okay. Okay, am I back on? I, hold on, I'm gonna stop share. You're back on. Okay, am I? All right. Yeah, good. Now, now, this is just the silhouettes of what these forms look like. And this, this is repetitive evolution of, 
of animals who aren't really related. So the, 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 the evolution of the whole community is similar. And that's just another similar picture. And oh, uh, okay, I won't rush it. Sorry. I'm, uh, so these are the twig anoles. You didn't see this before, correct? No, uh uh. And the key. Yes, we did. Oh, you did see it? Okay, some sort. Some of us. Anyway, sorry. Okay, this was a, a, a one of these other examples of convergent evolution uh, on different islands where these guys basically are shaped alike, look alike, and are not related to one another are related to the other people nearby on their islands. And one more example, these are grass living anoles. They tend to be streamlined. They tend to have a long white stripe and they are not related to each other. They, they, each Antillean island does this. And finally, what I was talking about mm. was that within islands, even within small islands, you can have multiple, you, you tend to have speciation starting anyway, and you have very distinct uh, forms living within uh, near, near one another. So what I, I'm going to now try to summarize what this was originally going to be a whole hour talk. I'm sorry, but we'll be five minutes or six minutes. Um, was that when I corresponded with this professor in the West Indies in Trinidad, he told me of this unusual story of these two anoles. One is called Trinitatis, which is named after Trinidad. And the other is called Aeneas, which I think, I don't know what that means. I, uh, my Latin's not that good. It's another species. Um, Trinitatis is found on St. Vincent and Trinidad. And Aeneas is found on the Grenada Bank, which is the island of Grenada and a bunch of little islands that go north of it. Each island, again, in this Lesser Antillean chain, you only see the bottom two, has its own a unique form or two, or two species. So the weird thing that intrigued this Professor Underwood who got me down there was what's keeping these lizards apart? Why am I finding pure enclaves of one species or the other? And so I went down there to study them and look at their ecology and their physiology to some extent and to try to figure out what was going on. And um, what so this is what Trinitatis looks like. I can't make it any, any bigger. It's a very beautiful animal. He's green. And Aeneas is grayish and speckled. It's the same size. They're actually very similar. They're just different size photographs. I started finding animals who looked funny and intermediate to me. And I was, didn't have a biochemistry background, but I wrote to a professor who worked on uh, in the University of uh, Louisiana State University in the, in the biochemistry department who was interested in reptiles. And in those days they were doing electrophoresis. Now everything is different. In five minutes or an hour, you can sequence something and have 50,000 times more data than I could get in months. Um, there's been this whole technological revolution that bypassed me, but so it goes. But so using electrophoresis of blood proteins in which you, you put a sample in a gel and you run a current and the proteins migrate and then you stain them, it tells you something about the size and shape of the protein. And what we found was that all the funny looking animals that I suspected were funny uh, had a, like a double band. The Aeneas was slower in migration than the Trinitatis and this had both. And this is blobby, but um, was the first indication that we had um, indeed did have hybridization between these two species. I also found, and you saw in the movies that they bob their heads and do funny things. And back in the day, we didn't have computer, you know, iPhones, but we took 16 millimeter movies and uh, photographed displays and analyzed them frame by frame and drew little pictures. And in fact, Trinitatis would bob his head very quickly and Aeneas slowly and the hybrid was exactly in between. So the hybrids looked weird, but not too weird because these lizards aren't all that different, but they were identifiable. Uh, and, and the hybridization was indicated by, um, as I say, um, biochemically and also with hints of behavior. Now that doesn't mean that um, they're separate species, uh, I, I mean, you know, my genes are not identical to the next guy's genes and the police can tell us apart. Um, the question is, are they actually biologically separated? 
and what's going on. Well, it turns out that as I was doing field work in Trinidad, these guys were found only in disturbed areas. They were never found in the forests. Whereas on the Lesser Antillian Islands, the native species are found everywhere. They're found in the forests, they're found around homes and gardens. And as I said, Trinidad is um, it's a continental island. It has many more species of predators, many more species of birds, many more species of um, uh, mammals and uh, large lizards who eat lizards. And these guys really in their native islands face no predation strain significantly whereas they, they seem to not be able to live in big patches. If there's predators around, they don't make it. So they're in these disturbed areas. Now, animals in dis that live only in disturbed areas, an indication often that they're introduced. You tend not to find English sparrows in the real, in the real forest. I mean, introduced animals often do better in disturbed situations. So I started, it, it occurred to me that what was going on was that you probably had, there's a lot of trade, but those were all British colonies and a lot of flower pots and food went, and you probably had introductions of both. And when you have introductions of both, they would meet up and they would hybridize. But what did that mean? So I then decided to look at chromosomes. People weren't looking at I mean, now we look at 5,000 genes, but this was a big deal back in 1965. And um, it turns out, without belaboring things, that both species have the, um, six pairs of these big chromosomes, which they call macrochromosomes. A lot of lizards are like that. And um, the hybrid, and, and then they had one species had 11 pairs and the other had 12 pairs of microchromosomes. So it was a, an indicate, and you needed a lot of, of good of specimens to, to um, of, on the slide to make sure that you were counting right. When I was in high school, which was only a few years before that, we didn't know how many chromosomes a human had. They told us we had 48 in my high school textbook. We had only 46. But the techniques for tissue culture and extracting chromosome information improved. And these were intermediate in number. Okay, so that's a further indication that they're hybrids. But what was more interesting was actually studying meiosis, that is the, the production division for the production of sperm. Uh, eggs would be the same, but you can't get as big a sample size. And what was really interesting is that the parental species it would have six pairs when, when the, 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 the pairs come to for uh, the reduction division, and you get one, two, three, four, five, six in one species, and one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, there's six. And what we found in the hybrid males was very poor pairing. The chromosomes didn't recognize one another. And since they don't recognize one another, then in the reduction division, you get all kinds of nonsense and you don't get an, an even the, the, the um, complement of of one male pair, you know, the male parents haploid and the female parents haploid. And that's almost certainly what was going on that the two species could reproduce, the hybrids had a reproductive failure. Um, it was, it's possibly not complete. We found one possible back cross, but basically the chromosome study seemed to, to nail down what the problem was and that these indeed were two species who came from two different islands, who met, who couldn't tell each other apart. Now you say, why couldn't they tell each other apart? Well, where they evolved, every lizard of the right size was a member of their own species. So they probably were not as finely tuned as a large island where there are multiple species and where each one has a different kind of dewlap and you make sense of it. Here, if a lizard is finger size and finger size, ah, that's the right size. So um, what was interesting is, um, well, I won't go into cytology here, but uh, the, you, you, there's lots of sperm production in the, in the parental species and, and mu much less in the, in the hybrid. There's also another weird thing that the female hybrids were giant sized. This is the, um, the length uh, plotted against body weight 
and these are the female the females of the hybrids and we think that's because egg production takes up so much of their energy that they um they just keep growing and they're, they're not producing any eggs and so they the females were really almost readily identified as uh, Amazon, uh, giant giant females. So this, the, I, I really rushed through this. This is a, a long seminar, but I think what, what was interesting to me, at least in the early 60s, this was integrating techniques that people weren't, not many people were crossing all these boundaries, you know, doing the biochemistry, doing the cytogenetics, look at the behavior, look at the ecology. And that's what got us into it. And this is one of my, my early papers in 1968. I'm, I'm only 37 now, so it's pretty amazing. <laughs> and uh, on the hybridization. And we also published a paper. We actually showed sex, chrom sex chromosomes weren't known in lizards. So we, we did that. I think I'm going to end now. This has been very, you've been very patient. I'm really sorry about the technology on my part, but uh, I don't know why the moving picture, the people weren't really moving. They were jumping, but but you got the picture. So now I will turn it over for questions, but you have to tell me what button I have to push. Okay, so you can stop share if you like, okay. or if you have if you have more slides that you think you might want to show, you can. Uh, no, I mean, there's, there's that one other film, if people want it, it's about six or seven minutes. I think they're pretty interesting, but I, I think, I don't know. I, 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 I can't. Uh, uh, George, I put the links to the three movies in the chat so people will be able to look at them later. If you oh, yeah, that's out. perfect. Okay, uh, great. Everybody, make sure you sh save the chat before the meeting ends so you have those links. Great, great. Okay, so I guess this is. Oh, everybody's muted. Do who unmutes? Oh, them? I'll unmute them. So if they have any questions, comments, criticisms, witticisms, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> so, Audrey, do you want us to just shout out or do you want to? Hey, hold on just people? a minute. I'm going to unmute everybody. Uh, everyone unmute themselves, okay? How do you want us to do it? Raise our hands or? Well, you can just go click your unmute button. I did. Okay, so um, there are a few people who are still muted and haven't clicked theirs, but we can hear you. People have gone home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, Greg is not unmuted and uh, Al is not unmuted, but I don't even see them, so. I see Greg. Oh, you do? Okay. Okay. Yeah, he is. Greg, you can unmute yourself. Um, I, he has when I, it says mute, and then there's another blue thing with three dots. Can I unmute him with those three dots? Uh, maybe. Let's see. I'm unmuted. He did it. He just did uh, it. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, go ahead, you guys. Have well, I'd like to ask a question. Yeah, yeah. Go for um, it. <laughs> so I was just uh, responding to your um, discussion about um, you know eating your subjects. I gather that some of your colleagues uh, tasted the uh, the lizard, uh, but you claimed that you didn't. But I, no, no, no. Nobody ate the tuatara. I was kidding. We've eaten iguanas, but uh, yeah. that's that's yeah. about. Uh, as far so as I just way. did want to mention that Audrey and I were uh, uh, around that period of time, maybe a little bit later, we took our kids to Key Cocker in Belize and um, we attached ourselves to a family and would have dinner with them every night. And it was basically, you know, people would go fishing and whoever brought food back, you know, the, the mother would cook it up and, you know, with rice and beans or whatever. And so uh, one day uh, we decided we would go into town um, and uh, there's a little boat that would take you into Belize City. And on the way back, there were, were, were some guys selling iguanas, uh, uh, all trussed up, you know, and they um, <clears throat> were selling them right by the boat. So we said, oh, well, we'll bring some food back to the family. So, uh, so we brought the iguanas back and um, the, the mother, uh, she didn't know how to cook it because her culture, she was from the Spanish speaking uh, people. Oh. Belize is a mixing pot it's of about three different people, peoples. Yeah, but the, her daughter-in-law was from the, uh, I forget the name of the other group, but the, they did do it. So the daughter-in-law took charge of these iguanas and cooked them up for us. And 
including the eggs, uh, which were these sort of leathery, uh, very strong tasting. I didn't really care for the eggs that much, but the rest of it was, uh, I'd say an improvement on chicken, really. Uh, Better than chicken, huh? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the question I wanted to ask you was about the deer because I wouldn't have thought there were deer on Komodo. Were that, were yeah, I think it's the sandbar deer. I'm not, it might not be the cervidae. I don't know what family it is, but- uh, they're, so, But they're it's not still there? Yeah, I think they are. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll double check it, but- um, yeah. I'm sure the uh, Komodo didn't care one way or the other, but- No, would... they don't care if <laughs> they're introduced <laughs> native, right. Anyway, uh, that, was, that was my question. Yeah, Audrey. I have a question. Uh, um, you mentioned you mentioned that a tuatara in New Zealand was not a lizard. Correct. Now, why why is it? Not? Well, I don't. Uh, the skull is really quite different. I mean, you, you have to get into their anatomy. They have a much more primitive skull. They're they're a different earlier lineage. Um, so, I mean, that's that's how we know. Also, if you start looking at these genetic distances or immunological distances, they're very distantly related. I mean, they're reptiles, but they're, they're not. They're just converge. It's, it's just a convergence on a body, kind of body. Um, is there a common definition for lizard? Um, is there a common, yeah, yes, <laughs> but it would be based on, on anatomical skull things. In other words, there are some, there are some legless lizards that are not snakes. Um, mm -hmm. Lizards have ear bones, snakes have lost their ear bones. Lizards tend to have, even if they've lost their legs, some have lost their legs, they still have um, pectoral and pelvic girdles. So th they're osteological definitions, but basically they're scaly reptiles <laughs> um, that aren't crocodile. I mean, they're not turtles. And the, the big problem is telling lizards from snakes because snakes are really a der derivative of lizard and it really depends where you want to draw lines. I mean, like birds are now considered reptiles by they're the same lineage, so that's not a very good answer, but you, you usually will not have trouble if you pick one up, uh, the, telling that it, uh, the, the only one I know of is the tuatara who would really throw you, and maybe some of the legless lizards are somewhat snake-like, but look for ear openings. Uh, mm. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, I never got to my last slide. I wonder, that was fun. That was, ah, ah, ah. Well, uh, can, you get, can you get to it? I don't know. Maybe I lost. Maybe the I screwed it up. Screen. Yeah, that was the whole. Uh, uh, no, wait. Now screen whiteboard. Let's go through this once more. Oh God. What? Um, <laughs> what? Preview Enola's talk. Uh, oh yeah. Let's go to the very end. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I didn't tell you the the the, the yeah. So I I left. So I moved back to Berkeley 40 years ago and, and, and quit being a professor and I went to law school and people asked me why and I don't know. <laughs> I never finished ring to find out. <laughs> so George, have you, are you gonna share your screen? Oh, you're, Christ, uh, I thought I was sharing it. No, you're not, not yet. Sharing it, go back to Zoom. Oh God, I can't do these things. Um, <laughs> am I not, still not? Nope. <sighs> I guess I don't have it down. <laughs> Zoom, no, this is the Zoom meeting you invited me to. Okay, you've got. Who's in a Nova's talk? What am I looking for? Well. <laughs> Look at the row down at the bottom. The row at the bottom. It's what one will say chat and record and reaction. One of them says share screen. It's green. Yeah, well, I guess I'm in the wrong place. Usually it's green. Yeah, no. it's green. Well, maybe it's you lap. It's well, do lap is green. Maybe you are just sharing, but you're I, not. I, I'm, I'm clicking on a thing that says share screen, but nothing's happening now. Okay, George, up at the top of your screen, does it say um, screenshot or does it say Chrome? It says speaker view, recording, blah, 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 Zoom meeting. Oh, okay. So down at the bottom, does it say get out of full screen? Down at the bottom? Uh, no, I see a share screen. And I have a white box. It says screen, whiteboard, iPhone. Keep going. Photo. What else? Photos in Enola's Zoom cloud meetings. Is okay, that it? How about photos in Enola's? 
photos. You need to. There you go. There we no, go. You, you do see it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. This was uh, this was this was um, just supposed to be a joke. But I did change <laughs> careers, and I did have uh, a whole other set of careers, um, as one of the gentlemen whom I met earlier um, uh, said. He he went from what science to finance. I sort of did the same thing um, roundabout, and I don't and and I don't explain it, but um, except to move back to Berkeley. Uh, we love Berkeley. So yeah, what actually happened was um, both Amy and I have moved to Berkeley three times. Um, she came here as an undergraduate. I came here to start graduate school. We didn't know each other then. Um, second incarnation was after I finished my degree at Harvard. I switched, I transferred from Berkeley. I was in the field, the Enola Skies were at Harvard. I got invited back here. I met Amy. I married her. We lived happily ever after. But um, I had to take a job and my job was at, at UCLA. And then when I decided I didn't want to live in LA anymore, I changed careers and came back <laughs> and with Amy. So we've each moved here three times, but we've been, this house we've been in 40 years. That's pretty All right, that's okay. the end of my life story. <laughs> well, wonderful. Well, George, thank you very, very much for- Well, I appreciate it. For us, it was so interesting. I, I loved it. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I, 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 I encourage everyone to look at those films, those movies. They're only five or six minutes a piece. I found them fascinating. I think you will as you. well. So, right, and I, I just want to promise that if I ever do this again, I'll be better with the technology. I promise. Uh, I promise. <laughs> Hillary, I promise. Oh, well, at least there's a possibility, George. <laughs> well, right. Your arm. Okay, well, thanks so much. Is there right. anything else anyone wants to say before signing off? Roger, any more from you about yeah, your... Yeah, Gre Gregory, yeah, Gregory. Oops. Okay, I think he was just saying goodbye. Oh.